Welcome to the part two of season four of the KU International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. I'm Sung Hun Lee from International Christian University. Today, we have two exciting talks by Jenny Balik from University of California, Santa Cruz, and Hannah Sandy from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Shigeto Kawahara from KU University will introduce Jenny. It's my pleasure to introduce Jenny Bellick, who is a postdoc researcher at the Linguistics Department of the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her PhD is also from UC Santa Cruz, which is on vowel intrusion in Turkish complex onsets. Uh, with a number of other researchers at Santa Cruz, she has been working on a general project called SPOT, which stands for Syntax Prosody in OT. And I had a pleasure of learning a little bit about it when they gave a workshop at Ninjo, Japan in December, 2019, the good old times when we were able to meet in person. And um, well, anyway, I believe that her talk is going to be about something about related to spot. So go ahead, Jenny. Thank you for that kind introduction and just a moment. All right, um, before I start, I wanted to say I'm especially happy to be at this venue because I actually spent my, my childhood in, in Japan. So it's, it's special to be here. Um, all right, so I'll be talking about size effects in prosody, counting branches versus counting leaves. And thanks to my co-authors, Nick Calavota at Lund University and Nick Van Handel at UC Santa Cruz. Right. Phonological phrasing reflects syntactic phrasing. And this is formalized in match theory. So Selkirk says that in the ideal case, the grammar allows fundamental syntactic distinctions between clause, phrase, and word to be reflected in and retrieved from the phonological representation. But this reflection is not perfect. Uh, purely phonological considerations also affect prosodic structure, leading to mismatches between the syntax and prosody. So in optimality theory plus match theory, these mismatches are motivated by prosodic well formedness constraints. One of the most commonly used prosodic uh, well formedness constraints is binarity. And I'll focus on phrasal binarity here. So phrasal binarity says that a phonological phrase or phi should contain two elements. And typically this is broken down into two components. Maximal binarity says that the phrase shouldn't contain more than two elements. So it penalizes a phrase with three, four, five elements in it. And then minimal binarity, which says that the phrase shouldn't have less than two elements. So it penalizes a phrase with just one element in it. So for an example here, phi one, uh, has exactly two daughters, so it satisfies maximal binarity and it also satisfies minimal, bi minimal binarity. Whereas phi2 has only one daughter, so it satisfies maximal binarity because it doesn't have more than two, but violates minimal binarity because it only has one. So this talk is about an important distinction within maximal binarity concerning a basic question, which is uh, what counts as two elements. So let's see an example here. Uh, phi one has two daughters, but it contains four words, right? Because those two daughters are both phi's in their own right, and each of them contains two words. So the question is, does phi one, this yellow guy, satisfy maximal binarity since it has two daughters, or violate maximal binarity because it contains four words? And you can find uh, papers claiming uh, both in the literature. So uh, there's two distinct versions of binarity that people have, have used. Uh, the first one says that a phi has to have two daughters. So I'm going to refer to that as branch counting. So we just count the immediate children. The other version is says that a phi should contain two words. And I'll refer to that as leaf counting, uh, sort of going with this the tree analogy. The leaves are kind of at the edge of the tree. Uh, both versions of binarity apply to other prosodic categories too, but I'm just focusing on phrasal binarity for concreteness here. So in this talk, I'll address two questions. 
firstly, do we really need two different versions of maximal binarity? And we'll see that the answer is yes. So branch counting binarity and leaf counting binarity each predict different types of size effects and both types of size effects um, we actually find in the real world. The second question is how does each version of binarity affect the predicted typology? And we'll see that leaf counting binarity complicates the typology compared to uh, branch counting binarity. All right, so before we jump in, uh, I wanna provide the formal definitions. Uh, so branch counting maximal binarity, I'll refer to as bin branches. Informally, uh, branch counting states that a phi should be binary branching and formally it says, uh, assign a violation for each phi that branches into more than two inter, inter, uh, immediate children um, of any category. Um, and then the other binarity, word counting maximal binarity, I'll refer to as uh, bin leaves. Informally, bin leave says phi should contain two words. And formally, it says assign a violation for each phi that contains more than two prosodic words um, at any depth. All right, so note that the branch counting binarity is evaluated locally. It, you only need to look at the node and its immediate children, whereas the leaf counting binarity, you have to look through the whole tree um, at every depth. So you could call it a global search. So uh, do we really need two versions of binarity? We're gonna start with a cross-linguistic survey. So we collected uh, about 17 analyses, depending on how you count, that employed binarity as a constraint. 10 of them defined binarity in leaf counting terms, five use branch counting terms, and uh, two employ both versions of binarity. For nine of them, uh, branch counting and leaf counting were interchangeable, so it doesn't matter whether you say uh, count the branches or count the words. Um, so here they are. Uh, for eight of these languages, the, the two are interchangeable because they assume strict layering. So what does strict layering have to do with binarity? So when all of the children of a phi are words, then um, counting the branches and counting the leaves or words uh, are the same. So as in this tree, right, phi one has three branches um, and it also contains three words. So there's no difference. And this is the type of scenario that you always see if strict layering is assumed, right? So under strict layering, uh, three conditions are enforced on the prosodic trees, non-recursivity, exhaustivity, and layering. Non-recursivity says that a phi cannot contain um, another phi. Um, exhaustivity says a phi can't, uh, can't have children that are lower than the prosodic word. And then layering says it can't have children that are higher than the prosodic word. So uh, if you require all three of those conditions, then the only possibility is that the children are all words. All right, so under strict layering, this distinction is irrelevant. Uh, but when you admit a uh, recursion or um, non-exhaustive parsing to the candidate set, then uh, there are important differences. So in particular, we'll focus on a recursion. So when a phi contains other phis, then uh, branch counting and leaf counting binary will pull apart. So here, this phi has uh, two branches, but it contains four words, right? So uh, under weak layering, when recursion or non-exhaustive parsing are considered, then it's important to distinguish between counting branches and counting words, um, especially for maximal binarity. Typically, it doesn't matter so much for minimal binarity because we don't normally permit this kind of vacuous recursion where you have a phi and its only daughter is another phi. So I'm gonna set aside minimal binarity for this talk because usually uh, word counting and branch counting are the same uh, for minimal binarity. All right, so returning to the survey, uh, we found uh, for, for the rest of the analyses of uh, recursion was, was part of the candidate set and uh, it mattered whether uh, we were counting branches or counting leaves. So for four languages, um, you need to use branch counting binarity, otherwise it, the analysis will break if you substitute leaf counting binarity. Um, all of these languages involve size-driven recursion. So when you have a longer string, it gets parsed with more recursive structure. And we will see a case study from uh, Irish phrasing. Then three analyses required leaf counting binarity. And if you substitute in branch counting binarity, that also breaks the analysis. And in these three, analysis, uh, three, these three analyses, leaf counting binarity is used to, oops, to create uh, category promotion. So longer strings are parsed, sorry, I've gone, gone back a slide. There we go. Uh, longer strings um, 
get promoted to a higher prosodic category. So a long phi becomes an international phrase in iota or a longer, a, a word that's too long gets promoted to a phonological phrase. And we will look at a case study from um, Italian phrasing. Uh, finally, we had, there's one um, pattern where both branch counting and leaf counting are required in the same, uh, to, in the same analysis. Um, and that's, that's for Japanese phrasing, in fact. Uh, I won't go into the, the details here, but feel free to ask about that in the, in the question period. All right, so to sum up, uh, we found that both branch counting binarity and leaf counting binarity are needed to account for the full range of syntax prosody mappings in the survey. And then, now let's see in more detail what each version of binarity does, starting with branch counting. So what does branch counting do? All right, so I'm gonna present some Irish data taken from Emily Elfner's work. Um, in Connemara Irish, a low high pitch rise shows the, the left boundary of the non-minimal phi. So it's a phi that contains some other phi. And then the high low pitch fall shows the right boundary of any phi. These diagnostics show the non-branching subjects are rebracketed in the prosody to be phrased with the preceding verb. So Irish is a, a verb subject object language. Um, so the verb precedes the subject like this, um, as in this example, bot teachers bags white, where uh, bot and teachers are phrased together. Uh, schematically, it looks like this. So the, the syntax has this kind of right branching structure, but then the prosody gets this balanced branching structure. So we can see this is a syntax prosody mismatch. And in Elfner's analysis, this results from the constraint strong start being ranked over match. Right, so strong start says assign a violation for every prosodic constituent whose leftmost daughter is lower in the prosodic hierarchy than its sister immediately to its right. So let's, let's see what that looks like in a tableau. Uh, so here the first candidate is the, uh, the isomorphic parse. So here's the, the right branching syntax, right bot, uh, teachers bags white. And then this is a prosody that has the exact same shape, but the categories are just relabeled to be prosodic categories rather than syntactic categories. And you can see each um, XP in the syntactic input has a phi in the prosodic output. So there's no, no match XP violations. Uh, but it has two violations of strong start because there are two words that are um, initial in the phi, but are and are sister to a phi, right? So the, the verb is sister to a phi and the noun, uh, subject noun is sister to a phi. So those strong start violations are repaired in the second candidate, candidate B here, where rather than matching the TP with a phi, um, we create this phi that with the, the verb and the subject noun together. So that violates match once for the, for the TP, uh, but eliminates the strong start violations. All right, so so far we didn't see any binarity. So the binarity comes into play when we look at branching subjects. So for branching subjects, the rebracketing is blocked. Um, so here's, a, here's an example sentence, a cell, librarian, handsome, flowers, beautiful. And here the, um, the TP already has this kind of balanced branching structure and with the verb sitting next to it. And then in the prosody, that structure is replicated like so. I, I should say I'm using parentheses to stand for the phi boundaries. Um, this isomorphic parse violates strong start and it's driven by high ranked bin max branches. So let's see the tableau for that. All right, so again, the, the top uh, parse is the isomorphic parse and then the second candidate is the rebracketed one. So this, the, here this time the isomorphic parse is the, the winning one. And you can see it doesn't violate bin max branches because all of these phi's are uh, binary branching. It does have one violation of strong start, uh, again, for the, the verb being sister to a phi, but that doesn't matter because bin max branches uh, is ranked higher than strong start. In the second candidate, which is the loser, the subject has been rebracketed into a phi with the, with the verb. So this is equivalent to this guy with the non-branching subject. 
Um, but this time that uh, that verb plus subject phi is a problem because it has three branches. So it violates bin max branches and rules out this candidate. So then we co correctly predict the, that the isomorphic parse will be the winner with the branching subject. All right, so we've seen the, the ranking bin max branches over strong start over match uh, gives us the Irish freezing pattern where strong start prevents matching of non-branching subjects, but then uh, when it comes to branching subjects, branch counting binarity demands that you match them. All right, so bin max branches acts as a special case of match XP here. Uh, in contrast, leaf counting binarity does not favor matching a branching subject. So let's see what happens if we swap in bin leaves for bin branches. So you will recall that bin uh, branches favors the isomorphic parse. Bin leaves can't distinguish between these candidates. Um, that is because both of them contain two phi's, phi one and phi two, that contain uh, more than two prosodic words. So phi one contains uh, the verb and then all the other words. So that's that's five. So that's that's the first violation. And then phi two uh, contains these four prosodic words. Uh, that's so that's in the isomorphic candidate. Two two violations of bin leaves. And then in the rebracketed candidate, uh, it's the same situation where phi one also contains all five prosodic words, and then phi two uh, contains these three. So they both have two brand. Um, two violations of bin leaves, and the choice will be left up to strong start instead, incorrectly predicting rebracketing even for the branching subjects. Right, so um, Irish phrasing lets non-branching subjects be rebracketed and phrased with a verb, but requires branching subjects to be matched. And bin max branches accomplishes this, but bin max leaves does not. Right, so this is a case where we really need to have branch counting. So what we see from this example is that branch counting binarity is a structural notion of binarity. It's better satisfied when additional structure is built. So we get uh, what you could consider size-driven recursion um, and size-driven isomorphism. So since the syntax is also structurally binary, branch counting prosodic binarity reinforces match. So you preferentially match branching constituents uh, like the branching subjects here. And we can find similar results at the word level uh, in Danish compound prosody, for example, and feel free to ask about that in the question period as well. Uh, in contrast, leaf counting binarity is not improved by building recursive structure. So uh, what does leaf counting binarity do for us? Let's see a case study from Italian. And this is based on work by Nick Van Handel. Uh, in Italian, lengthening of the stressed vowel diagnoses the final word in a maximal phi. Uh, so that's a phi that's not contained in any other phi's. Uh, Italian phi typically contain um, up to two prosodic words at an average speech rate. A right branching structure consisting of three words is split up into two separate maximal phi in the prosody. So we can see that from this example, um, ate all the cake, mangerà tutta la torta. This is phrased as two separate maximal phi and you can tell from the lengthening on both mangerà and uh, Porta. So um, this is a syntax prosody mismatch because of the change of category. So let's let's see how this works in the tableau. Um, here, the isomorphic candidate is on top again, and then the, the unfaithful one is on the bottom. So in the, the isomorphic candidate, we've got a phi for each of the XPs. And the top phi, that's the, the root, violates bin max leaves because it contains all three words. Uh, but there's no match violations. In the second candidate, um, there's a match violation because we're no longer matching the, the largest XP with, uh, with a phi. Instead, it's become an intonational phrase. So we could say it's sort of been promoted to an intonational phrase. Um, that avoids the violation of bin leaves, but it incurs this match violation. Uh, and this candidate wins because bin leaves is ranked over match. Right, so this is size-driven category promotion um, and it's a, it's a mismatch driven by the leaf counting binarity. Okay, and it really needs to be the leaf counting binarity if we substitute in uh, branch counting binarity 
just like in the Irish case, this doesn't distinguish, well, it's the, the inverse of the Irish case rather, uh, branch counting binarity doesn't distinguish between these two candidates because both of them are perfectly binary branching. So the choice would be left up to match, which would favor the isomorphic candidate. So branch counting does not favor category promotion and can't select the winning structure in Italian. So the Italian situation is that Italian phrasing maps small XPs to fives, but maps larger XPs that contain uh, three or more words to intonational phrases in a syntax prosody mismatch. And leaf counting binarity can give us this category promotion, but branch counting binarity cannot. This is because leaf counting is a length oriented notion of binarity. It's not concerned with structure. For that reason, it competes with match, uh, giving us mismatches like the one we just saw. Bin leaves is satisfied by changing large nodes to a higher prosodic category or by just deleting them altogether, um, as in this example where we sort of promote the phi for the TP up to the iota level. And we can find similar results at the word level for Japanese compound prosody, which is another thing I can talk about in the question period. All right, so let's take stock. Uh, so we start out by asking, do we really need two different versions of maximal binarity? And we've seen, yes, we really do need both. So branch counting binarity gives us size-driven recursion as in the Irish example, and leaf counting binarity gives us size-driven category promotion as in Italian. And obviously both phenomena are attested, so we need both versions of the constraint. So we can then move on to the second question, which is what are the implications for the predicted typology of each version of binarity? And we saw that branch counting binarity acts as a special case of match. So bin max branches never conflicts with match constraints. Leaf counting binarity is always coming into conflict with match constraints. So we can hypothesize that systems with bin max branches plus match will give us simpler typologies than systems with bin leaves and match because with branch counting, there's less constraint conflict. So the method here is to compare the formal typologies predicted by two OT systems that differ only in using bin branches versus bin leaves. So I'll start by defining the optimality theory systems. Um, so that means we need the, to define the candidate set um, or gen and the constraint set or con. And then we'll calculate violations using the uh, syntax prosody and OT app, and then calculate typologies using OT workplace and then compare their sizes and complexity to see what we find. All right, so let's talk about the candidate set first. Um, gen is the candidate generator function and we'll define it like this. Given a syntactic tree S, then gen S will be all prosodic trees P such that P is rooted in the iota and all the intermediate nodes are fives uh, and terminals are words. Uh, X0 terminals in the syntactic tree are mapped to word terminals in the prosodic tree, preserving their linear order. Uh, we'll use weak layering. So the children of a phi could be other phi's or they could be prosodic words. Um, and then I'm also allowing words to be parsed directly up to the intonational phrase. Uh, but we prohibit vacuous recursion and then also require that every iota contains at least one phi for proper headedness. So this is a fairly typical weak layering candidate set. Um, but the problem is it actually gives us a lot of trees. So how many? Here's a, here's a graph and note the logarithmic scale on the y-axis here. So uh, the purple line is the, the gen that we're interested in, the weak layering one. So if we wanted to consider all the trees that meet those criteria with uh, four terminals, there's already 351 of them. Uh, and say we wanted to go up to consider sentences with six words in them, that would give us uh, over 25,000 possible trees. Um, with strict layering, the candidate set doesn't grow as fast, but it's still an exponential growth. So obviously these types of numbers are impossible to deal with by hand. So that's why we use a couple of tools. So the first one is uh, the spot app, syntax prosody and optimality theory. This is an open source JavaScript application that I've been developing alongside Ozan Belek and Nick Calavota since 2014. And it's currently supported by an NSF grant to Junko Ito and Armin Mester. So spot generates the violation tableau of syntax prosody systems, and then we can then import them into an, um, another, an OT tool, such as OT Workplace. That's the one I've used. Um, this is an Excel-based tool for doing OT analyses. OT Workplace can calculate formal typologies as well as the constraint rankings. 
All right, so let's define the, the rest of the systems. So uh, the inputs to gen will be syntactic trees, where S has, uh, syntactic trees S, where S has um, three to five terminals and they're just head complement structures. Uh, we could add adjunction structures, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the results. And then the outputs will be those weekly layered trees that we saw a couple of slides ago. Then the, the constraint set will be two match constraints, the syntax prosody matching constraint, so that's match, um, match XP, and then the prosody to syntax matching constraint or match phi. And then we'll have minimal binarity and then for maximal binarity in the branch counting system, we'll have uh, bin max branches. So that's the, that's the branch counting system. Um, then the other system we wanna consider is exactly the same. I'm gonna call it S leaves, and it just differs in using leaf counting binarity instead of branch counting binarity. So I calculated the typologies for these uh, using spot and OT workplace, as I said, and for the branch counting system, the typology turns out to contain just two languages. Binmax branches is never ranked against match SP, and we only see a conflict between minimal binarity, bin min, um, and match SP. So these two languages are pretty simple. Uh, in language, let's talk about language two first, actually. So language two is perfectly isomorphic since uh, match is ranked on top, so we just match everything. And then in language one, we match anything that's branching, but we don't match the non-branching XP. Uh, so here's a little bit more of the typology. Um, you can see there are non-branching phi's in language two, but not in language one, but otherwise they look the same. Turning to the leaf counting system, this typology contains four languages. So in addition to ranking minimal binarity against match, uh, we also need to rank the branch, uh, the leaf counting binarity against match. So that's a two by two giving us four languages. In this, uh, in this typology, languages one and two are exactly the same as the languages in the branch counting typology, um, right? So language two is perfectly isomorphic and language one is isomorphic, except that you drop the non-branching phi's. Um, these two languages are the ones where match is ranked over bin leaves. You can see that here. In, uh, so, right, so languages one and two are the ones where leaf counting isn't doing anything. In languages three and four, bin leaves is ranked over match SP. And as a result, the XP containing, XP's containing um, more than two words are not mapped to phi's. So for this three word case, uh, that means that there's no phi containing ABC, right? So we end up with some of the words being parsed directly into the intonational phrase. Um, so let's, let's zoom in on that fourth language where we have bin leaves ranked over match, uh, ranked over bin min. So, uh, and kind of take a closer look at what, look, what happens in, the, in a forward candidate. So the, the isomorphic parse on this top row is, would violate leaf counting binarity twice. So that's ruled out since leaf counting is on top. Um, and the actual winner is this candidate B, where C and D are parsed directly up into the intonational phrase. Um, so this violates match twice because we haven't, we, we've eliminated both the three word phi and the four word phi. Now, this is a winner that uh, linguists might not think of because it, it looks kind of bad because of these exhaustivity violations. Uh, I think as linguists, we like to imagine structures more like the one in C, where uh, you imagine adding a, another phi to get those C and D into a phi and eliminate the exhaustivity violations. Um, this does just as badly on, on match. Um, and in this system, the structure in C is never going to actually win because it has an additional violation of match phi, the prosody to syntax mapping constraints. We've sort of inserted this, this boxed phi here. It doesn't have a correspondent in the, in the syntax. So that's how we end up with this kind of surprising looking um, unbalanced winner in this language. 
And if we look uh, at the typology, like a little bit more of the typology, we can see that in these uh, languages three and four where leaf counting is ranked over match, um, there's exhaustivity violations all over the place, even for the, even for the five word cases and you end up with um, three, in the five word cases, you end up with three of these words being parsed directly up to the intonational phrase. Okay, so comparing these two typologies, we saw that the in the branch counting system, the typology contains two languages. Um, so one where uh, bin min is over match and the other one where match is over bin min. Um, and bin max branches is never ranked against match SP. In the leaf counting system, there's four languages because uh, we need to rank both bin min um, and bin max leaves against match SP. All right, so S leaves requires twice as many rankings as S branches, and its typology is twice as large as a result. Um, and bin branches doesn't need to be ranked against match as we expected. All right, so we can conclude. Um, to sum up, we saw that there are two different kinds of maximal binarity constraints, um, and they make different predictions. So branch counting binarity gives us size-driven recursion. Branch counting binarity often drives greater isomorphism for branching constituents than non-branching ones, like we saw in Irish. Um, it reinforces match SP and doesn't conflict with it. The other binarity is leaf counting binarity. Leaf counting binarity produces what I've called size-driven category promotion. Bin leaves doesn't tolerate excessively long constituents, even if they have recursive substructure. It conflicts with match SP and drives mismatches. Um, OT typologies that involve bin leaves plus match are more complex than those with bin branches and match. Empirically, both structural and length considerations shape prosody at multiple levels of the prosodic hierarchy. So we saw size-driven recursion in Irish um, showing us that we need branch counting binarity, and we also saw size-driven category promotion in Italian showing that we need leaf counting binarity. So we should consider both branch counting and leaf counting binarity to be valid, useful constraints. But since they each make different predictions, they must be disambiguated, at least wherever recursion is involved. So um, for the next time that you're working with language data that has size effects, here's a flowchart you might consider. Um, there's two questions you can ask to think about whether you want branch counting or leaf counting binarity. Uh, the first one is how are long constituents parsed? If they are parsed with more recursion, then branch counting binarity is what will give you that. If they are parsed as a higher category, then you want leaf counting instead. The other way to ask this question is uh, which XPs are matched more or for whatever level of the syntactic hierarchy. Uh, if large XPs are more likely to be matched, that's the result a result you can derive from branch counting. If small XPs are more likely to be matched, that's something that comes from leaf counting. So they really have different effects and should be differentiated. Uh, finally, leaf counting binarity should be used with care because it complicates the predicted typology and sometimes it favors candidates that uh, we don't expect. Uh, directions for further research. I'd love to know more about binarity at the level of the intonational phrase. So I have findings on the, the phonological phrase and the phonological word, but um, there's not as much about intonational phrases. Um, and I have to find out if there are other types of size effects that we, we haven't seen here. Um, and that concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Now uh, let's uh, applause. <laughs> so if you have uh, any questions and or comments, uh, please send your name and affiliation to Sung Hun Lee. I, just sent a message on the chat window, so you can uh, send it to me. So let's see, we have a question from Hannah Sunday at UC Berkeley. Hi, thanks, Jenny. This was great. Um, I was thinking about exactly one of the future, future research suggestions you had at the end in slide 60, um, specifically what the predictions are for intonational phrases like um, with the bin leaves mm -hmm. do you predict that that you would get promotion to something higher than an intonational phrase 
Um, I'm, I'm curious if you've thought about this or if you have ideas about what potential case studies um, to look at might be. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thanks. So I guess it, it you know, it's some people, it, depending on whether we want to allow the utterance as part of the the prosodic hierarchy, then, you know, then, then maybe we could promote to the utterance, but if we don't want the utterance in there at all, then, um, then I think that poses a problem and we might wonder whether, I mean, I'm not actually sure if people have proposed binarity for the, for the intonational, at least maximal binarity for the intonational phrase. Um, that would sort of seem to imply that you would never get, um, sentences that were excessively long or that those would be totally separate um, prosodic units potentially. So yeah, I'd love to see if there is some data on that. I don't know. Yes, thank you. Next question is from uh, Shigeto Kawahara, KU University. <clears throat> Sorry. I have a specific question and a more general question to relate it to each other. Um, I think I've missed this, but what's the evidence that the Italian phrases get promoted? Like what's the like phonological or phonetic correlates of? Yeah, okay, uh, let me find. So, uh, right, so the, the lengthening only happens for the maximal phonological phrase. Uh, mm -hmm. So since we have lengthening on two words here, we can say there's two maximal phi's. Um, if right, so if so, right, so the observed pattern is lengthening on uh, both eight and cake. Yeah. But yeah. if we had this one, then we would expect lengthening only on the cake torta. I see. And do we know that 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 uh, green top iota is not a higher phi category? uh right so if it wasn't if it was a higher phi then the the lower ones would no longer um, be maximal yeah. okay i guess I'm, I'm 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 raising this question because um as you said leaf counting binarity is uh, complicates us the story right uh, the whole whole theory so one way forward may even be to reanalyze those cases and say, you know, and it also has to do with locality as well, right? Because yeah, exactly. Yeah, leaf counting is violates our assumption about, you know, the, the locality of which category can refer to which level. So that that was my general. Right. Point. Yeah, because you have to look all the way down the tree, and then if you have prosodic words, it becomes even more uh, problematic, right? If you have um, if you have words within words, um, then do you count only the minimal words or do you count all of them or, or what? I actually, when I started this project, I was hoping to, I, I was noticing the first thing that had happened was that Nick Calavota and I had noticed okay, the, the typological uh, effects that you get from the leaf counting binarity and the fact that it, it requires this global search and, and, and it can give you these just like funny looking structures that, um, right, like these guys. Um, and so we were hoping to argue that you could, when we when we set out to do the, the survey, we were hoping to say, oh, well, maybe we don't even, maybe we never really need leaf counting binarity. And when we found, you know, that most of the time you could just swap in the branch counting, we were very optimistic about that. Um, and then, you know, we found these cases that you have to have branch counting. Um, and then the leaf counting, for this, for one of these analyses, you can swap in equal sisters and get rid of leaf counting. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, Junko and Armin have this analysis of Japanese compounds that requires leaf counting. But in that case, it's at the word level, right? So it, the thing it's counting is uh, feet and syllables. And so we thought, well, maybe we can say that you have these length effects when you're counting, um, you know, when you're counting these rhythmic units like feet, and we expect to have like, mm, we expect to have kind of these uh, 
these length considerations for, for rhythmic things. Um, and maybe we don't need to have uh, leaf counting for the, for the interface categories like the, like the phi. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but then we had the, then Nick Van Handel came up with this, this Italian case. Uh, so th that's actually the only one we found with the, the phrases being promoted to the, the phonological phrases being promoted to intonational phrases. So, I mean, I'd be very happy if we could come up with a, another analysis and say like, actually, let's just forget about leaf counting at the phrase level and only allow counting of the, of the feet. Um, because the, the branch counting really gives us a much simpler, it's much easier to understand what the branch counting does in the typology than what the leaf counting does. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I'll think more about the Italian case then. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. so Nick Van Handel has a paper coming out in, um, in phonology. Oh, okay. This. All right. So, yeah. Thank you for that question. Oh, thanks. Jenny, I have a, a short question. Like, uh, you talk mainly about the phonological phrase level, and uh, if you uh, and Hannah ask about like what happens at the intonation phrase level, did you uh, did you have a chance to think about like uh, what would happen uh, with the binarity prosodic word, for example, like a uh, one level down? Once you include that in the typology, what? Uh, uh, um, yeah, so we have a couple. You know, I have a couple examples. So I did this study of uh, compound words in in Danish. Where we needed branch counting type, uh, branch yeah, branch counting binarity. Mm -hmm. This is the pattern with the 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 stud, the glottal accent. So mm -hmm. this that shows us the right edge of the the prosodic word. So mm -hmm. I, I've marked them all in green. Yeah, and so with the stud, you can find length driven differences in the compound prosody. So if you have like the a short word and then a long one, then where they both have stud, uh, if they appear in isolation then the, the long one retains its stud in the compound. So like um, train passenger, you keep, you keep the stud only on the passenger, but not on train. Uh, but if you flip the order and then you say passenger train, then they both keep their stud. So that suggests this kind of uh, difference in their, in their structure where um, the long ones keep a, uh, get, uh, get matched and the short ones don't. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is kind of length effect. So we we yeah. analyzed this with uh, the branch counting, max uh, bin max branches, and then non recursivity and uh, match. The, I, I should have put match x zero. Um, right, so the this is the this is the tableau of the the flat version. So they're if they're if they're both um, if they're both short, then uh, you get this kind of um, prosodic structure where they're both, you parse the, they're just, they become feet and they go up into one word and that satisfies bin branches and it also satisfies non-recursivity, but you violate uh, match x zero twice, right? Because there's no, there's no prosodic word for the, the individual components of the, of the compound. Uh, but then when you have the, one of the elements is long, like a uh, train passenger, then you do something different. So um, if you do the flat structure for that, then then you violate the branch counting binarity as well as as well as match, and that's not tolerated. Um, but if you had a perfectly matching structure, then that gets you like an extra violation of non-recursivity, and so you preferentially pick this this kind of thing. Um, I think I have the, and the leaf counting doesn't do that for you because the, the, you can only get out of that leaf counting violation by changing the, the top, the root node up to a, up to a phi. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I have the example for the Japanese compound words too, um, where you actually want the category promotion. Um, right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and Hannah had another question. Uh, Um, hi again. So I just wanted to, um, you mentioned early on in the talk that in Japanese, you have the need for both bin leaves and bin branching. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe you started answering this in your response to Shigeto, but um, I was wondering if those are with respect to different phenomena in Japanese, or if you need them both to account for a single context. You need them both for uh, this 
scenario. So this is like a very famous, the famous um, mismatch where if you have a perfectly left branching syntax, you re-bracket that into this uh, balanced prosody. And this is actually the phenomenon we were looking at where we noticed um, that leaf counting favors um, the like non-exhaustive parsing, right? So this, so uh, you can tell from the pattern of um, the rises that mark the left edge of the phi that we need not just a phi on the, the first two, but we also need a phi on the second two, this guy. Um, and people have modeled this before with leaf counting binarity, uh, but uh, the thing is you actually, uh, okay, I think I don't have the slide that I wanted. Um, right, so uh, right. So if you have the, you, you need leaf counting binarity in here somewhere because um, branch counting is perfectly happy with the isomorphic parse. Um, word counting is the one that, the word counting doesn't like the isomorphic parse, right? Because it contains two phi's with three words in them. Um, right, and we're, uh, whereas uh, it's, it's more okay with this balanced parse because there's only one phi with more than um, more than two words in it. Uh, so you can get this top. You can like keep this top phi by saying uh, match match max xp. So you you have your like specialized match constraint on top of um, your regular match. Um, but then the 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 problem is that if you have just the word counting binarity, then you actually favor this this structure that we saw. Um, earlier where it's it's imbalanced. This one's not quite as terrible. It doesn't actually violate exhaustivity because of ma the match max keeping that top phi um, as a phi, but uh, it, it's it's really ugly. Um, and it's not, it, we have good, you know, we, you, it doesn't give you the, the, the observed um, rise on this third word. So then if you, if you use both binarities, then you can force this one to come out. Very cool. Thanks. Thank you. Let's thank uh, Jenny one more time. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk and also being all prepared for the <laughs> responses <laughs> uh, with multiple slides. Uh, this ends the first talk. We will now um, open the breakout room and have uh, uh, further discussion. The recording will first stop.